So I guess I need to uh, share my screen. Let's see. Um, can you can you see my screen now? Yep, you're all good. Okay, so then I can get started. All right. So um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about using logs in real-time audio processing and. That's a topic that um, ever since I started, um, you know, working professionally in the audio industry, which was in 2012, um, it just keeps coming up again and again um, in discussions with experts and programmers and um, people are saying different things. And, uh, you know, first I started really just learning the basics and then I started asking questions and then I noticed that some experts didn't really know how to answer them and then they answered them in contradictory ways. And I was like, uh, but like, can we now actually do this or that? Or can we not do this or that? And I got like very different answers. And whenever this happens with a particular topic in audio, this I know then, okay, you know, this is probably a good time to like um, make a talk about this because it means I actually need, really need to have to sit down and figure it out on my own. And so this is what happened here. Um, so we're gonna talk about locks um, in an audio application. Um, so, um, and this is, by the way, this is based on a blog post that I wrote um, uh, recently, uh, which some of you might have, might have read. I have uh, some uh, new data, um, which is not in the blog post. Um, but yeah, so let's get started. So locks, obviously you need them when you have threads. So as we uh, heard previously also by, from uh, Jean-Michel in his talk, uh, if you have like a complex application, you have lots of threads going on. So um, if you're doing audio, you always have an audio thread. Um, that's the thing that makes sound. So you have this quartz crystal in the sound card, which is giving you a timer. And then you, know, you have uh, your process callback, which is going to get called in regular intervals, something between one and 10 milliseconds. If you have like you know, typically 44 kilohertz or in like 128 um, sample buffer, then you're going to have like three milliseconds between the process callbacks. And that's like a real time callback, which means, you know, you can't miss one basically. Um, otherwise you're gonna get a glitch. So that's the thing that you have going on. Then typically you have a UI thread or a main thread, which is going to be um, responsible for the GUI. So, you know, simple example, you have a volume knob or something like that. And then, you know, the user might turn the knob that's going to be picked up by the UI thread and it's gonna change the value. The audio thread has to pick up that value somehow. It also goes the other way around. The audio thread might get like an automation value from the host. So that needs to then uh, go back into the UI thread because that needs to repaint the knob with a new position. So you have some, some stuff going on there. Um, then you might have a MIDI thread where the user is playing a keyboard and making music and you have MIDI events which are going to be coming into the audio thread. You might have a file IO thread or maybe a network IO thread which is going to read um, maybe a WAV file or like some other sound, uh, which then the process callback needs to play back and you need to get that into the audio thread as well. So um, how do you synchronize all these threads? And um, obviously, you know, if you just go like the computer science way, there's a bunch of ways to synchronize threads. Um, but if you look at the red arrows, uh, which are going into and out of the audio thread, we have this additional constraint that it's a real time thread. So there's just a lot of stuff you can't do. Specifically, you can't block. So um, how do you do this instead? And there's like a bunch of methods and I talked about them in previous talks. So I um, just briefly kind of like one is obviously using atomic variables. So if you have a volume, you can use an atomic float. If you have something else, you might use an atomic int or whatever. Uh, so that's really easy because you can get and set them. Uh, there's not gonna be a race condition there. It works across threads. It's automatically synchronized. So that's perfect for something like the volume knob. Um, the other method is you have log free queue, which is perfect for things like streams of events that are coming in um, to the audio thread, like MIDI messages. So you're just going to push your MIDI messages into the log free queue and then pop them on, on the audio thread. Um, so those are very popular methods, and I had talks about both of them um, in the past. So I'm not going to talk about that. But what happens if you have something that doesn't fit either of these scenarios? Um, and then Normally, you would reach for a lock, but obviously on the audio thread, you can't do that. So you would have, for example, if you do C++, you have a std mutex, for example, uh, or one of the other mutex types, and then you would um, 
lock it either directly or with this like scoped lock, which is like an RII way of doing it, which is nicer. But you can't do that on your OEDIS thread right? because first of all, locking uh, a mutex is a system call, which is not real time safe. Um, and then once you acquire, uh, so if you can't acquire the lock, you're going to be waiting for another thread, uh, which is again not real time safe because it's some code somewhere else. You have no idea how long that's going to take. Um, so you're waiting for something which is going to take a non-deterministic amount of time. So you can't do that. And then on top of that, you also get priority inversion because you're waiting for a thread which has lower priority than the real-time thread. So yeah, because of all these problems, um, you know, the basically the probability that you're going to have an audio glitch is going to be above zero, and that's not good. So you can't do that. Um, so yeah, that has been covered before. Um, but like the question is now, what do you do instead? So what happens if you have not a float, not a, a stream, but something like a data structure, like for example, a vector of floats or objects or um, a linked list or maybe a graph. And uh, you have this whole structure and then you need to, for example, write into that structure from one thread and then read from that structure from the audio thread because you just need those numbers or objects or whatever it is for your processing. So what do you do then? How do you synchronize this without taking a mutex, without locking a mutex? And so I think the proper answer to this is immutable data structures, uh, where basically you say, you're just not going to modify this structure from one thread and then read it from another thread. But instead, you're going to um, create a copy of the data structure, which contains the change you want to make. And then the audio thread is only seeing the old version or the new version, but you're not modifying anything, right? So you're just like making a copy and then under the hood, you're going to be uh, swapping a pointer atomically. And then next time around, the audio thread is just going to see the new vector or list or, or graph instead of the old one. And um, so I think that's the proper way of doing it. And Juan de Bolivar has a bunch of talks about this topic. So um, I'm not the expert here. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, and if you like, there's also other kind of related strategies around like object sharing and pointer swapping and other things. And for this, I can recommend the talk by Fabian and Dave uh, from ADC last year. And they go about like a bunch of techniques how to do this. Um, so highly recommend it as well. But today we're going to talk about the situation where, well, maybe you can't just rewrite your whole, your audio thing to do these things. Like for example, what happens if you have an audio graph? Maybe you're working with, um, a legacy code base, right? Where the audio graph and the audio engine, that's just the way it works. And it just happens to be not an immutable data structure and there's a lock around it. So how do you how do you do this safely? Um, where like, yeah, you, you just need to um, somehow work with the fact that you do have a, a data structure that's going to be accessed by both the audio thread and also another thread. And um, yeah, so we're gonna talk about how to do that. But um, so what I did, um, for example, in the code base that I'm currently working with is I actually looked in there and there were quite a bunch of locks there that people have put there. And um, just looking at uh, where they are, what are these use cases? And it turns out, I'm just gonna give you a few examples of where I saw these locks occurring um, on the audio thread in practice. Things like the audio thread is, for, maybe you have a sampler, right? So you're playing a note and then you want to play back a sample. So you have a list of these possible samples that could play, maybe matched to the notes, um, like MIDI message, MIDI note numbers or whatever. And then the audio thread is like looking through this list to figure out which, which sample to play. And then at the same time, another thread might add more samples to this list. Uh, another example is you have a polyphonic synthesizer and you have a, a vector of voices maybe that the audio thread can use. So it's going to like look through this vector of voices to find one that it can use uh, for a new note. And then the other thread might allocate more voices because the user has clicked on a button that, you know, increases the polyphony or whatever. And then you again, you have in a situation where you have a, a data structure that's being manipulated from one thread and then read from the other thread, which is the audio thread. And again, you have this problem, how do you synchronize this? And then the worst case is if uh, you have to synchronize basically the whole audio graph. Like let's say you have a big audio graph structure which describes your whole audio graph and your audio thread is basically processing this whole thing and that's your whole plugin. But then the other thread is rebuilding the, the whole graph because, or inserting notes into the graph because something happened. Um, and that's like the worst case. Like how do you, how do you synchronize that? Um, so, we already said you can't use std mutex like this. You can't 
you, you can do lock on, on a GUI thread, but you cannot do this on the audio thread. So what alternatives are there? And so one thing that I saw um, in production code, people did, um, and I actually did uh, myself because I didn't know better, um, is this, where you say, OK, well, we can't lock a mutex but on the audio thread, but we can try to lock it. We can do this try lock here. Um, so um, either you can do directly mutex uh, try lock, but then you don't get RII, so you have this RI wrapper, the unique lock, which is like a more flexible version of the scope lock, and you can say try lock. And the idea here is that, um, well, you're not going to wait for another thread to release the, the mutex um, because you're on the audio thread, you can't block. So what you're going to do is you're going to try to acquire the mutex. And if you get it, because no one, no other thread is doing anything with that um, thing, then you can do your processing. But if you fail to acquire the lock, then um, that's going to fail. It's not going to wait for anything. And then you have to use a fallback strategy, something like, oh, well, I can't access that data structure now. So I'm going to just you know, use the, if it's parameter values, I'm going to use the ones from the previous pullback, which is OK. Or if it's like an audio file that I can't play right now, OK, I'm going to try to play it the next time around. Or maybe, uh, OK, I don't know what to do now. I'm going to fade out. Or I'm going to like, you know, something like that, like a fallback strategy, which is, depending on the use case, it might be OK, or it might be not entirely what the user wants. But in any case, it's going to be better than an audio glitch. So it sounds like. Um, yeah, this might work. Um, people do this. Or is it? Is it actually OK to do that? Now, that's an interesting question. And to answer that, we need to figure out what try lock will actually do, or this like unique lock try to lock. So unique lock try to lock, as I said, is just an RI wrapper. So what it's going to do is it's going to call mutex try lock under the hood. Is it fine to call mutex try lock on the audio thread? Hmm. Well, so if I don't know that, then usually what I do is I look into the C++ standard, because I really like the C++ standard, as some of you might know. The C++ standard says about try lock, well, it's going to uh, attempt to obtain the mutex. And if, if that fails, then there is no effect, and try lock immediately returns. OK, so that sounds pretty real-time safe. OK, there's no waiting, there's no blocking, there's no system call. It's just going to immediately return if it fails. So you're going to get what you want. Um, and that is fine. Yes, except this is not the only thing that is going to happen in this code that's on the screen. There is another call which is going to be made, which is going to be called when we reach this closing brace here. And let's see if I can uh, maybe ask the people on the call, maybe, because I, I would like to ask the audience, but you're all in the YouTube chat, so I don't know how to reach you. Um, do you know what's going to happen here? OK. So if you. Um, so you managed to acquire the lot. You've done your audio processing. Then you hit this closing brace. Um, now, if there is no other thread waiting for the mutex, then you're fine. Nothing happens. If there is another thread waiting for the mutex, so basically, this is going to call mutex unlock. And if there's another thread waiting for the mutex, then that mutex unlock is going to have to wake up that waiting thread, right? So you have another thread, which is, might be waiting on the mutex. If so, mutex unlock is going to actually wake up that thread, which is a system call. OK? So that is not real-time safe. And this is interesting, because when I published this on my blog, there was um, a bit of a discussion um, where a Linux kernel expert said, well, but so on Linux, this is implemented with a few texts, so you're going to have like a few text wait call, which is which is kind of fine. Um, it's not going to do any work. Um, but then actually Fabian answered, um, well, but actually it might do. And actually, here's like a link to a research paper which says, which says it's not real time safe. So it's funny. Um, apparently, on Linux, um, people like the experts don't really agree whether it's real time safe or not. Um, 
but actually it doesn't even matter because you also have, you know, this is cross platform code and we also have Mac and windows and on Mac and windows, you don't, you can't look at the source code of the kernel. I have no idea what's going on there. It's just a system call. So, you know, by default, it's just not real time safe. And so even if it's real time safe on Linux, which I don't think it is, um, basically you can't count on that being real time safe on, on every platform you care about. So, you know, the standard advice is just as always, if it's a system call, it's not real time safe. It's going to be non-deterministic. You're gonna, in any case, you know, have to switch from user mode to kernel mode. Um, that's a context switch. And then it's, you're gonna have like, the kernel's gonna do some stuff and you don't know what. So um, basically you can't do try lock on the audio thread. This is just not a thing that is safe to do. Okay, so this is not real time safe. Don't do that. All right, so, but we still have the problem that we have a data structure that you want to access. And um, you want to access it concurrently and we need to synchronize the threads. So what are you going to do instead of the mutex trilog? And another technique which is um, well known is using a spin lock. So a spin lock is um, actually real time safe. Um, here's a simple uh, implementation of a spin lock. Um, so it has basically whenever you implement any kind of mutex, if you're using the standard library interface, you're going to always have to implement these three functions. First one is lock. Um, and so for the spin lock, um, it's going to just try to lock the atomic flag, um, which uh, flags whether it's taken or not taken. And every time it fails, it's just going to try again. So it's going to have this like infinite loop of like just trying to lock it. Then you have the try lock, which is just trying to um, um, basically set the flag once. And if that fails because another thread has set the flag, it's just going to immediately return false. So that's easy. That's real time safe, just like before. Um, but then the difference is the unlock. So the unlock, um, now that doesn't contain a system call, unlike with the mutex, but it's just clearing that atomic flag, right? So um, that now is also. Uh, real time safe. So now with the spin lock, we have a situation where both the trial lock and the unlock are actually safe to call on the audio thread. So you can actually can use this lock, um, the lock function, which is going to do the, the busy waiting. Um, and um, actually, Juice also has uh, a spin lock implementation. So for those of you who have used Juice, so use Juice, there is one there. I don't, to be honest, particularly like the Juice implementation because A, it doesn't use the proper uh, memory ordering flags, the client release. So it's not quite optimal um, in terms of performance. And it also doesn't use lock, try lock and unlock. It has like different names for these things like enter and exit. So it can use what you can, you can work with the juice thing, but it means you can't use it with the STL facilities, the C++ stuff like um, scope lock and unique lock and all those things, they're not gonna work. Um, but yeah, so then you're gonna have to roll your own um, because the standard library does not contain a spin lock. Um, but yeah, so that's really simple to do. This this is going to work. This is this is a spin lock. So that's going to be real time safe, right? There's no system calls anywhere, um, and try lock and unlock are not waiting or blocking or anything like that. Um, so that works. You can use it, right? That's that's safe. Oh, actually, another question, another thing I wanted to say here is that um, I got a comment um, on the blog post that actually. Um, test and set is not optimal. So um, you would have to do uh, test and test and set, which is better because test and set, every time you do that, it invalidates a cache line. So the problem here is that you can't really do test and test and set with an atomic flag because the atomic flag does not allow you to test it without setting it because that's like the primitive. Um, so if you want to do the more optimal test and test and set, you would have to do like an atomic bool or something like that. And then uh, you have to check that it's actually lock free, which it always will be, but just put a static assert there and then everything becomes like a bit more complicated, but you can, you can do that and it's probably going to be more optimal. So it's left as an exercise to, to the reader. Um, but anyway, like whichever way you do this, like some variation on, on this technique, um, it's going to be real time safe. So we can use that in the audio thread. Is it a good idea though? Is that is that a good way of doing things? Like, so it's it's you're not going to cause glitches, so that's good. But is this really a good way of solving the problem? 
So let's look at the log again. So that's the thing that you're going to be calling from the um, from the other thread, from the GUI thread. What is this doing? So it's going to try to test and set the flag, uh, basically in an infinite loop, right? So if the audio thread um, has the lock, it's going to just try again, try again, try again, try again. It's going to keep pounding this atomic flag. Um, on my machine, it's like 200 million times a second. I actually measured. That's quite a lot. Um, so uh, it's going to completely max out that CPU core on which it is in, right? So that's extremely energy inefficient to do that. And actually, get to, so if if it's something that you do like once in a while, like whenever the user you know clicks a button somewhere, which they're going to do very occasionally, it's fine probably. But like the worst case scenario is basically that you have an audio thread which is like really busy doing some heavy processing. Um, and then like you're at 90% CPU load because maybe you have like some really beautiful but really expensive re reverb algorithm going on. So 90% of one core is going to be um, basically the audio thread like computing, computing. And then um, the other core is going to be also like 90% like or 100% because the other thread is going to be just keep pounding this atomic flag all the time. So you're going to have two cores basically maxed out um, that's going to suck your battery dry really, really quickly. So that's not a very good idea. So we can't really do this either, except, you know, in certain circumstances where you're using it like rarely and briefly and it doesn't matter. Um, what are we going to do instead? And this is the point where I ran kind of into a, a dead end because none of the experts around me in the audience tree really had an answer to that question that like I found satisfying. Um, so yeah, I was like, okay, how do we actually solve this problem? Like none of the code I'm looking at seems to be doing it, like seems to really have found like a proper solution. And whenever I encounter dead ends like this, I usually um, look outside of the audio industry, right? So audio industry, obviously, you know, we do C++, we do low latency, but there's a bunch of other audio industries doing similar stuff. We have the finance, like the trading people, we have the games people, we have the, um, you know, graphics people, and they're all doing kind of related things. So maybe they have found some solutions to this. So, you know, I did some research and, um, I remember that Bryce, um, Bryce Delbach, um, who works at NVIDIA, did this talk um, last year. Um, so there's a CPP conversion of this talk um, uh, from CPPCon last year. Um, I actually watched uh, also the C++ Russia version, which he gave like a month later, which I think is actually the better version of this talk. So I recommend you watch that. Um, so that's a brilliant talk. Um, so Bryce um, is on the C++ committee. Um, that's where I know him from. And he was giving this talk about the new um, synchronization facilities and the new C++ 20 standard. Which are things like barriers and latches and um, other very useful utilities. So it's an amazing talk. I recommend you watch it. Spoiler alert, none of the things in this library are real time safe. So you cannot really use any of them on the audio thread. But it's a really interesting talk to um, it's kind of going to get these concepts about like different synchronization primitives. Um, but the more interesting thing is that uh, in his talk, uh, Bryce introduced, um, well, not introduced, but talked about a concept which I presume has been well known for some time, but I haven't known about it personally. So I've discovered it only at Bryce's talk, which is basically the way to deal with this problem or the way, you know, graphics people and finance people and Linux kernel people deal with this problem, which is exponential back off, right? So that's the strategy that, that you need here. And um, Bryce was um, showing um, a particular spin lock Im implementation in his talk, which is using the exponential back off strategy. And the code in his slide um, was this. So this is Linux code. This looks scary. Um, Actually, turns out that the try lock and the unlock and the atomic flag is exactly what I showed before. So the only real difference is in the lock function. So let's take a closer look just at the lock function. Okay, still looks pretty scary. This is obviously like Linux specific code, but let's try to kind of understand what's going on. So um, we have these like different stages of the exponential backoff. So we have like in the uh, previous example, we have this like 
loop, um, which is like, un unless you like succeed to get the lock, uh, so there's like a try lock, if, as long as it fails, it just keeps going. So you, you still have this like same kind of infinite loop. But in there, you have like four different things. So the first thing we're going to try is we're going to try a couple of times to just basically spin on it and just like try to get the lock quickly. But then if that fails, um, you know, four times, then probably we're going to have to wait for a bit longer. So we're going to um, kind of stop burning this energy in this infinite loop. And instead, we're going to go to the next stage, which is this um, scary looking ASM volatile, the, the inline assembly instruction. Uh, which is this rep not instruction, which is like an Intel specific thing. But what it actually is, it's a CPU pause instruction. Um, so what this does is it's going to just put the CPU to sleep for just a few cycles, which is great because um, it's still pretty quick, but um, the CPU is not going to burn any energy um, you know, on that thread in this time because nothing's happening. It's just basically store, like pausing the CPU. And if you're like on a uh, somewhat um, recent uh, Intel chip, then you're going to have hyper threading. So it's even better because you have like two threads that can, can go through the same CPU pipeline. And um, so if one of the threads is pausing, then the other thread gets to actually do it, do its stuff in the same time. So you're benefiting from hyper threading here. So, so that's like a really efficient way of um, just like basically doing this, like waiting, but not like in a busy waiting way that burns energy, but just basically not burning energy and also letting another thread do some work on that core. So now Bryce is doing that 12 more times. And then if that still fails, then okay, then probably we need to wait for even longer. So we can do something else. We're going to actually yield from this thread. I'm going to say, hey, thread scheduler, maybe let another thread try to do its stuff. And you're going to come back later. And if that fails um, a few times as well, then you're actually going to start putting the thread to sleep and wait for like successively longer periods of time. So um, there's a, the, the, like as a strategy, like this is great. This is like a, a good way of, of approaching the problem in principle to have these like progressively longer and more energy uh, efficient uh, like stages of waiting. If you look a bit closer at this, there are a few problems um, like one thing that I don't like about this implementation, for example, is that you have this for loop around it and then if clauses inside. So that's actually turns out is not good for the optimizer. It's particularly not good for the branch predictor because um, you know every time you go from one stage to the next, the branch predictor is gonna have a mispredict and then gonna take a while for it to readjust and you're just wasting time again. So so you would have to like probably better to like do an a, 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 like different loop for every stage. But then the much bigger problem is that this is Linux specific or like, so the um, inline assembly in the second line is going to work on a Mac, but it's not going to work for Visual Studio because Visual Studio doesn't let us do inline assembly anymore. Thanks Visual Studio. Um, and then the rest of the code is just really Linux specific stuff. So that's not gonna work on another pl uh, platform at all. And that's not really what we want because even though this is, we're still like specifically doing code for like Intel chips here, which we're gonna talk about other stuff later. We really, you know, if you're like doing plugins or DAWs or any kind of music software, we probably want this to work on, on Linux and, and Mac and Windows or at least Mac and Windows definitely. Um, and hopefully also Linux. Um, so then we need to re-implement this for every platform we care about. That's no one's going to do that. So in his talk, Bryce actually says, well, there is a, in C++20 with a new library, there is a cross-platform way of doing this using um, like this, where you have, um, so Stood Atomic actually has a new interface in C++20 where you have uh, these wait and notify methods. And the idea here is that um, you're just going to do this like wait and notify on this atomic flag. And then basically now it's the um, compiler vendor's job or the standard library vendor's job to implement the stuff that we've seen on the previous slide basically under the hood. And you don't have to worry about that. It's going to work on the platform. So that's great in principle, but there is no guarantee that the vendor is going to um, implement it um, in, in this particular way, which is real time safe. So I heard from at least one. Uh, standard library uh, implementer that they would probably use like a few tags like with a, with a try lock um, or at least that's like a feasible strategy you don't really know as a user and that's again not real time safe and then on another platform you might have something else you don't know so like, like everything else in the C++ library 
this is probably not real time safe and probably there's going to be some system calls in there so you can't really use that for audio like on the real, on the audio thread so unfortunately sorry bryce this implementation is not going to work for us so okay let's go back to this so this is the linux thing again um turns out um even if we were to like port something like this to mac and windows this specific idea here like the idea with the stages is, is fine, but like the way this is done here is actually tuned for a different scenario, right? So remember, this is not written by audio people. This is written by, you know, people who do graphics and kernel development and maybe algorithmic trading and, and gaming and things like that. And uh, this specific implementation, uh, which came from, from Bryce who worked at NVIDIA is actually tuned for um, a scenario where you have like high contention, right? So you have, it means you have many cores, you have many threads, you have maybe dozens or even hundreds of threads and they're all contending for this lock. And in this particular scenario, this implementation is great because it's not just efficient, it's also fair. So it kind of distributes like, uh, prioritizes these like a hundred threads that are all waiting for the same lock, um, like in a fair way. Turns out when we're doing audio, we don't really have this scenario. Like we are not really dealing with high contention. Like every single uh, you know use case I've seen where people put locks in, in audio code, we only have really two threads going on. We have the audio thread, which is doing real-time processing, and we have one other thread which wants to modify something or read something or write something that the audio thread is using. Whether it's like the GUI thread or like network thread or some background worker thread, it's typically just one other thread. Um, so we only have two threads. We don't have this like a hundred threads like contention scenario. Um, so we're probably gonna use like different numbers and different stages um, to kind of optimize it for our use case. And obviously we also want this to be cross-platform. So we want this to work on Mac and Windows. So let's do something about that. Turns out like you don't have to use um, inline assembly. If you look into the Intel developer manual, there is, uh, you can use intrinsics, there's this intrinsics, mmpause, which turns out does exactly the same thing, except it's available on all the platforms that we care about. So if you include this um, intrinsics header and you, you do this um, intrinsic here, it's going to insert exactly the same instruction, but on Windows, on Mac, and on Linux. So that's great. So the scheduled is again, like a Linux call. Um, there is actually a standard portable C++ way of doing this, which is this red yield, which is doing pretty much the same thing. Um, and there's like sleeping stuff at the end. Let's forget about that for the moment. Um, so um, we're gonna talk about sleeping later. Let's look at these three stages. So we have spin, pause, and yield, basically. These are our three progressive back off stages. Now, in this implementation, we have these magic numbers there, right? Like 4, 16, 64, like where the heck do these come from? Like who, who tuned them and like how and, and, and are these good numbers for us or not? And um, so obviously I don't like magic numbers. Um, so I try to look at into this from the, through the lens of like audio development. And the first step really I thought was to like get a feel for how long these stages actually take. Right. And the only way to figure this out is to measure. So we have spin, pause, and yield. And I just want to know how long do these take? Like how long does one iteration around the loop take? And um, so in order to measure this, um, so I'm using catch two for all my unit testing, which is great. And it turns out catch two also has benchmark facilities. So that's even better. Um, so I wrote like a little test harness around this and like a little setup where you can actually like um, execute these different stages in a scenario where you actually have a lock going on, like spinning on like another thread doing some stuff. Um, I'm not going to show that code here because um, writing unit tests for asynchronous code um, is not trivial. It's quite a mouthful. It's, it's fun, but it's complicated. So I'm not going to go into how to like test um, asynchronous uh, concurrent code. That's like a whole talk in itself. Um, and I myself have a lot to learn about that still. So but I, I put together uh, basically a, a relatively simple setup to, to test this. And then I just figured, like, just measured how long each stage takes. And, and these are the results on the two uh, machines that I had available at the time. So at the time, um, 
we were already in lockdown when I did this. So I only had the two machines that I, I use at home, um, which is I have my Dell, uh, which is Dell XPS, which is my main development machine, which is what I use for coding. And then I have my MacBook, which is the other machine, which is the one that I use for making music. And um, turns out both of them have exactly the same CPU in them. It's like, you know, pretty new, pretty like high end six core i9. Um, so which is great. So it's the same CPU. So, so um, and then I tested like all three um, operating systems that we care about, which is Windows, Mac, and Linux. So Windows and Linux, obviously on the Dell and then Mac on the Mac. Um, yeah, and then it turns out um, spin, pause, and yield. Um, so spin uh, and pause take the same time across these machines, unsurprisingly, because it's the same same CPU architecture. So it turns out the spin takes about five nanoseconds. Um, pause takes about an order of magnitude more than that. So it's about 40, 40 nanoseconds, one pause instruction. And if you get to the yield, it's one, uh, one order of magnitude still uh, slower, but then we have a little bit of a scatter here because yield is the threat scheduler. So that's your operating system, right? So that's going to be implemented slightly differently on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So that's why, why we see like a little bit of scatter here, but not that much actually. So it's something around like between three and 500 nanoseconds. So we can say to a good approximation that, um, you know, very much true to the idea of exponential back off, like every stage is going to take one order of magnitude longer than the previous one. So that's what we want here. That's that's great. Um, so um, when I first published this, um, I had um, a piece of feedback um, from someone who was saying, "Yeah, but the, so you're using like one particular architecture here, but actually this MM pause, the the pause instruction on Intel actually varies wildly between different chipsets. So you might actually get like an order of magnitude difference in uh, the pause instruction, uh, how long it takes if you try this on like a different type of Intel chip. And I was like, hmm, okay, um, let's try this. So I actually tried this just yesterday uh, because now I have, um, now that we are in lockdown, everyone works from home. So I have like all my setup that I need for the current project that I'm involved in. I have that here at home. So I have a few more machines. So specifically I have like another low end PC um, which is just like a very cheap, like mini PC with like an Intel Celeron in it. And then I have a low end Mac as well, which is, so I got like this old um, old Mac mini from 2014, which has like a rather slow CPU and also like a different chip. Um, so I use them basically just for testing, but hey, I can use them to test this. Um, it turns out, yes, there is a difference. Um, so specifically on the Mac mini, uh, the, the one with like this, much older CPU, the pause is not an order of magnitude, less time, but more like factor of three. So I would argue that that doesn't make too much of a difference. It's not gonna, like later you're gonna see like the implementation that I wrote and it's not gonna, I think, make a critical difference on how it performs, but yeah, it's a significant difference. So maybe not, really relevant, but also I have to say, I didn't test this on an Intel Atom or an Intel Core 2 Duo. I remember when I had like Intel Core 2 Duo laptop, like, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, and then I was comparing that with like the newer i5, i7, i9 stuff. Like there were really weird differences with other types of in instructions, like how long they would take. Um, so maybe it's gonna look different on some of these architectures. I don't have these machines here. I can't really test them now, um, but like, Overall, I think it's not actually that relevant. Um, so the picture doesn't look that too different. So I think we can still say kind of each phase is roughly taking an order of magnitude longer than the previous one. So that's good. But let's look at this yield again. So that's kind of weird. So the yield takes something around 500 nanoseconds. So when I first saw this, I was really actually puzzled by this because I thought if you do a thread yield, what it's gonna do is it's gonna um, you know, yield from that thread. So another thread is gonna take over. So that thread is gonna miss its, its time slice, right? In the, in the thread schedule. And a time slice is something about 10 and 100 milliseconds. So I would have expected a yield to take up that much amount of time, right? So instead it's just 500 nanoseconds. So what the heck is going on here? 
didn't really quite understand it in the beginning, but then I um, did another test where um, instead of just running my little unit test with the benchmark, I was actually, um, I tried to recreate like a more realistic scenario where I took this whole benchmark and put this into a plugin. Uh, so compiled it as like a VST plugin. And then I put that VST plugin into a door and then I put like 20 other plugins onto different tracks in the same door. And then I just like loaded some stuff, which is like really expensive, like maybe some convolution reverb, which we found out, you know, sounds maybe has a bit too much presence. But the point here was that it, you know, consumes a lot of CPU cycles. So that was kind of what I, what I was going for. And then I had like other applications open, you know, Slack and like my email client and a bunch of other stuff. And I just like, ran the benchmark in this like more realistic scenario, which is like how I would actually use my machine if I were to like make music. Um, and it turns out, yes, in this scenario, um, the yield will actually sometimes um, yield. And then sometimes it's gonna take 10 milliseconds or even 30 milliseconds, which means yes, the thread, actually the audio thread or not the audio thread, the, the main thread, which was waiting on the spin, um, actually got scheduled out, missed the time slice, another thread came in, and then the thread came back like on the next time slice. Um, so that's what you would see. But actually, it turns out that it was not actually happening that often. It would only happen like about once a second or so. You know, maybe it's because I have like a six core machine. Um, maybe like on the Mac Mini, it would look different. Maybe it would happen more often. But anyway, like 99% of the time, the yield would, would not take. 10 or 30 milliseconds, it would take these 500 nanoseconds, even in this like busy, I'm actually trying to produce music here kind of scenario. Um, what does that mean? So what's actually going on here? Like, so we have this yield, what, what is this actually doing? If this is not really doing anything, if most of the time we are not actually going to be yielding. So what's going to happen if you call this yield is, well, okay, so you say, I want to yield, so you threat your, you tell your operating system the, the threat scheduler that you want to yield. So the operating system is going to say, okay, I'm going to switch to kernel mode, the context switch. Okay, you want to yield. Okay, cool. I'm going to suspend the thread. I'm going to put it to the, all the way to the back of the run queue. But hey, there's actually no other thread in the run queue at the moment. Okay, so I'm going to like actually immediately resume this thread again and context switch back and and then. You know, the loop goes around another time. You're going to do this again and again and again and again, right? Which means you just are back in a busy loop, right? You're just going to back, you're back in the, like, the first stage again. We're just going to, uh, you're just like burning CPU cycles in, in a loop, which is, which is doing nothing useful at all, right? So you're just burning cycles. So this is like the primitive spin lock again, except it's actually worse because now you're actually involving the kernel as well and you're switching between kernel and user space all the time. So this is actually a really bad idea in this scenario where we don't have high contention, where we're doing audio. Um, so let's not yield in a loop. Let's yield maybe once in a while. So let's say we have the audio callback going on. Um, and maybe one round uh, through the audio graph is going to take one millisecond, right? That's like realistic. Uh, uh, if you're like, if you have like a busy, thing that's doing a lot, like it's going to take you maybe one millisecond to produce the whole buffer if you have a lot going on. That's like a realistic number that I saw in benchmarks. So let's say like more or less one millisecond like that order of magnitude. And then you're, if you're looping, if you're waiting for your um, lock on the other thread and you didn't get it for like one millisecond, for like more than one millisecond, then you should start to become suspicious. Then you're like, Okay, if, if you're waiting more than one millisecond for this lock, then probably the audio thread would have finished its work by then. And if you still didn't get the lock, then maybe something weird is going on. Maybe you're under very high load. Maybe there's like other threads doing stuff. Uh, maybe we should yield, right? And just so, you know, if, if this happens repeatedly, then your GUI thread is going to miss a frame or two frames, which it's probably not going to matter in that scenario because you have clearly have like something else going on, something weird, or maybe the threat scheduler, scheduler is doing something weird. You don't know. Anyway, maybe every one millisecond or so, you want to re yield just in case to basically protect yourself from some, you know, threat scheduling weirdness or like system overload stuff, um, so that the GUI thread is not like locking up everything else. 
Um, but then once you feel that you want to go back to, to, to spinning, basically, uh, to like uh, the pause, the pause. So that's where you want to spend most of your time. And so we said, we don't want to get in a loop. Um, and then talking about sleeping, you actually don't want to sleep either because a sleep is just a yield and then a wait, right? Um, so that's not going to be useful here either. And actually sleep has another problem. So let's say um, the callback, um, as we said, is, is going to get called every one millisecond, let's say. And then maybe you're at 90% CPU consumption, right? Because you're doing a lot of expensive convolution verbs, for example. Um, so you're going to get called every one millisecond. And 90% of that time, you're going to be churning numbers in the audio thread. So you only have a 100 microsecond uh, window for another thread to jump in and grab the lock. So if you're going to sleep for 100 microseconds, then you're probably going to miss that window of time, which is very narrow. You're going to miss it again and again and again and again. And then your GUI is going to get laggy. Um, it's going to, you know, your GUI is going to freeze, basically. You don't want that um, to happen. So let's not sleep for our use case. So OK, it's slowly starting to emerge how you want to tweak, uh, like, the original like Linux block that we saw before for like specific audio stuff. So let's look again at our use cases here. So this is kind of three examples that I picked out where you know, people were using Trilog, which we now know we shouldn't be using, um, which I want to replace with uh, our new spin lock, which is um, real-time safe and also energy efficient. How long are these things going to take? Like if in, in the each use case, how, for how long is the audio thread going to be busy for? Turns out if you are like, Traversing a vector, check if the vector is empty, like a check like that. I benchmarked it on my machine, it's going to take maybe 25 nanoseconds. You know, it could be different. It's just like very rough, um, kind of like this is what I saw in this particular benchmark kind of thing. And then if you just have like a handful of elements in that vector, just like looping through them and getting like your pointer back, then that might be something like one microsecond, probably not longer than that. And then obviously, if you have like a vector with like a thousand elements, then it's going to take longer and longer and longer. And then at the extreme end um, of the spectrum, you might be um, processing the whole audio graph, which, you know, in this particular um, very like CPU intensive plugin that I was working with would take like one millisecond to go one way around the audio graph. So you have basically more than five orders of magnitude of how long you might be waiting for this lock if you're the GUI thread. And the lock has to kind of work for all of these, right? So that's why we're going to have to have these like progressive stages going on. And that's how we're going to tune our numbers. So, so let's implement our new lock. So as I said, um, let's not have a for loop around everything, but let's have like a for loop for every stage because that's better for the branch predictor. So let's start with the um, stage one. Stage one is just the spin lock, which is just going to do the, the, the busy wait, which is like the fastest thing because it's like five nanoseconds for one try, right? So um, yeah, so let's do that maybe five times. Um, that's just really a number that I kind of chosen. I could have chosen a number, different number. It's like not five is not particularly, it's nothing special about the number five. It's just if the audio thread is doing something very simple, like you know, checking if a vector is empty, that just takes this amount of time. So maybe if you're in this scenario, we're just going to like really quickly grab the log, not doing anything more sophisticated. So we're going to like spin five times uh, for this amount of time. Now, if that fails, OK, the audio thread is doing something maybe a bit more involved. So we're going to go to stage two. And now we're going to do this pause, right? So now in this pause, we're going to try to get the log. If that fails, we're going to insert one pause instruction. And we're going to do that in a loop. So uh, the pause is great. Um, turns out, so, so here I'm doing this like 10 times. Um, and that's the number where, OK, if the audio thread is doing something um, maybe which is not like primitive, not trivial, it's not a no-op, but it's some quick operation, you know, it might finish during this time. Um, but this stage really has a problem still. So the pause instruction is really efficient. Um, but if you implement it like this, it turns out that the stage two is still going to spend 10 times, 10% CPU time doing stuff because we have a loop and we have a counter. So I measured this, and it turns out MM pause is going to 
you know, stole a CPU for like uh, 300 something nanoseconds or whatever it was, but uh, like, sorry, 30 nanoseconds. Um, but then um, you're gonna have a loop counter which you need to increment and then you have to like jump and then, you know, do that. And, and that takes about 10% of the time in this particular loop on this particular machine. So we are still burning 10% energy. It's better than 100%, but we can do even better than that. And so for our stage three, we're going to um, do basically 10 pause instructions in a row. And this is a bit annoying. I actually have to write them out because if I put them in a loop, then um, some compilers, I, I check the like GCC, Clang, and, and MSVC on Godbolt. I think GCC, I'm not, I remember, like, Either GCC or Clang, one of the two was the one that wouldn't um, basically would roll it into a loop and introduce an extra counter, uh, which is not what you want. If you want like literally 10, 10 instructions here because you've got to pause for like that amount of time. So we have to write them out, which is mildly annoying, but okay. And that stage now, you uh, basically reduce the overhead of doing stuff from 10% to 1%, right? because you're doing like 10, 10 pauses in a row. And this is really great. So um, this is where you really wanna spend most of your time waiting in this loop, because this is basically not gonna consume pretty much any energy at all. And other threads can make progress at the same time. So that's where you wanna be. That's like the green stage three. And so we're gonna stay in stage three for about one millisecond, which is what we think is the order of magnitude of how long we should wait for this lock to be acquired before we should really start getting worried about the audio thread because it hasn't returned in a while. So that's weird. So something weird is going on. So maybe we should yield uh, just to protect us from like some threat scheduling weirdness or some other stuff that's going on. And then we yield once, we don't yield in a loop, we yield once and then we just go back to the beginning of stage three and, and loop in these like 10 pauses again. Um, and yeah, so we're going back to like the um, kind of energy efficient thing. And, and yeah, that's basically it. Um, that's kind of what I implemented here. Uh, like the only thing that is kind of not nice, we still have magic numbers here. I don't like magic numbers. So I'm gonna put them into like an array at the beginning. And then I put like a big comment there explaining um, where these um, numbers come from and what timings they correspond to. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much uh, my spin lock um, for Linux, Mac, and Windows for x86. Um, that's what I'm using currently in production code. Um, it's not perfect. Uh, we saw, like, obviously, I benchmarked this on this particular CPU, which is like a really high end CPU. Uh, when you get to, like, obviously, this has to work across consumer hardware, where, you know, if someone's buying a plugin, they might have an older Mac or an older PC uh, or maybe. It's just a smaller laptop that consumes less energy and then they're going to have different measurements. So I don't think it matters too much. I think it's still fine because it's still going to be roughly within the same order of magnitude. But to make this like really if, more efficient, um, we can do a few improvements. So first of all, um, you know, if you really want to tune this for the machine you're running on, what you can do is like on startup of your application, you can do one little benchmark to see how long the pause instruction takes. And you can just like slightly adjust the numbers. Uh, you know, how, um, how, how long you want to spend like in stage two and stage three, um, how many iterations uh, to adjust that kind of for the CPU pause duration that is actually happening on the machine you're running on. So you can do that in startup and then Every time you get like this callback, which tells you, um, I'm gonna do processing now, here's what the buffer size and the sample rate is gonna be, which on juice is gonna be called prepared to play. So then you know how long uh, an audio callback is gonna take, like the maximum amount of time it's allowed to take. So with that number, you can, um, again, like tune your, your spin lock even a little bit more precisely. And then I'm not really convinced this is necessary, but you know, some people have pointed out that you might wanna do that, so. Yeah, I haven't done that yet. This is like another exercise that I might do in the future. Um, and then obviously the more important thing is that everything we saw so far is specific for Intel chips for x86, sorry, x64, 64-bit architecture. But now obviously we live in a different world. So as we already mentioned several times today, Apple is going for ARM chips this year. 
you know, uh, we all got our um, uh, developer transition kits now, and we're trying to port our scrambling to port our stuff to ARM. So obviously, I will need to go ahead and implement this for ARM, um, which I don't think is going to be difficult. So ARM has um, like two kind of instructions which are interesting here. It's like WFI and WFE, wait for interrupt and wait for event. And it looks like WFE is the one to use here. So actually, the ARM documentation actually even says this is what you should be using for spin locks. Uh, if you go into their like CPU manual. Um, so that's, I think, um, the equivalent of the pause instruction on ARM. So probably it's just going to be a matter of like plugging that in and maybe tuning the numbers a little bit um, or just using the auto tune thing um, if I have it at that point. And hopefully it's going to be a very smooth um, port to ARM. But I haven't actually done any of the stuff yet. I'm not sure if I'm going to run into any unexpected problems. So, so let's see. And yeah, obviously the other uh, future work is um, basically to do all this and then publish it on GitHub. So it's going to be open source and freely available. And um, I haven't done that yet either. Um, so right now this spin lock thing sits in the middle of this project I'm working on, which is like currently closed source code. So I definitely, definitely want to like, you know, take this and like other kind of low, low level utilities that we've written there, kind of like uh, move them out and like put them into like a standalone library and put that on GitHub and make this free and, and open source. But haven't got around to do that yet. So I'm going to see how I'm going to go about that. But hopefully that can happen um, soon as well. Right, so that's basically uh, future work on this. Um, yeah, and I'm pretty much at the end of the talk. Like the last thing I want to say is um, I want to thank uh, three particular people, these friends of mine who um, really helped me a lot with preparing this and figuring out how, how to write this. And we're so patiently um, you know, answering all my questions, hey, how does this code do? Uh, what does this piece of code do? And how does this work? And actually telling me a lot of things that I didn't know before. So thank you very much, Gasper and Dave and Fabian for um, teaching me things. Um, um, yeah, and that's it. And this is how uh, you can use locks in real-time audio processing. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Timur, for your talk. Uh, we have... <clears throat> couple questions from our community. So the first question is from Jean Miguel. Instead of updating the graph structure itself, what do you think of sending commands that will be modifying the structure of the graph as std function on the audio thread? Oh, okay. Very interesting question. Thank you. So there's quite a few things here. So first of all, std function specifically. Um, oh, before before you answer, you want to unshare your uh, your screen? Oh, yeah. Um, how do I hang on? I, as I said, I've not done this before. Um, how, ah, hang on. So I need to oh, now I have a mouse cursor again. Stop share. There you go. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Great. Okay. So, so first of all, this is like an aside. Please don't use std function for real time stuff yeah. because it's like a type erasure thing. But in C23, we're going to get um, a new thing. It used to be called function ref. I think now they called it. Um, Oh, we had like a long discussion on the committee about this. Um, some someone said any any function any invocable I think is the current name for it, but I'm not sure it's final. But and it's also not in C++ yet, so we're gonna get it in 23. I suspect um, it's not gonna do the type erasure thing. It's like a like a safer safer version of it. Oh, sorry, it's going to do the, the type erasure thing, but it's move only. So you're not mm. gonna be copying that thing. Yeah. On the that can just never happen. So it's like a lot safer. And I'm pretty sure there's going to be implementations of that flying around like way before a super stuff when think comes out. So that that's an aside. Your actual question, um, very interesting. So I said in the beginning, actually don't do any of the stuff. You use immutable data structures. That's my actual recommendation. If you if you're writing new code, don't yeah. do any of this. Um, but now actually someone else, um, like a colleague of mine, pointed out to me recently that there's yet another approach, which is just like data-driven, it's called, I think, data, I don't remember. There was like a gaming person who I also don't remember the name of gave a um, talk about that at CPPCon last year where they like wrote the whole game engine with this approach where you don't actually even have an immutable data structure. You don't have anything at all. You just have these messages which encode like the changes in the structure and you just exchange those messages. And I think that's what you were getting at, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And this is super cool. And um, 
I have to say I have not had time to pro like explore this idea yet. Okay. And it might like this this guy wrote like a whole game engine with this approach, and it seems to work for them. And they say it's like super efficient and super nice. I have not had time to research that yet, but like it's definitely on my list um, of things okay. like to try out. Like maybe that's maybe that's the, the the best way of solving this. So I can't answer your question really because I haven't looked into this, but I am aware of it, and it might be a great solution. And um, there will be future work in this space, but okay. I don't know the answer yet. But if you find out, please let me know because I'm super curious about this stuff. Okay, well, that, that's what I'm using currently in Austria, but I'm always wondering if it's the right thing, you know, or yeah. so. Yeah. Oh, so you are actually using it. Okay. So what's your experience with this? Um, well, one big thing, one big problem was uh, guaranteeing atomicity of big change. And I think one thing that we aren't getting is, you know, that transactional memory thing. And um, for that, that will be really useful because you have sometimes multiple commands that and got changes, but sometimes you need multiple commands to actually, um, they are part of a bigger command, so you put them in a vector or stuff like that, but that's not very satisfying, I think. But all the way, I, I'm always yeah, on the fence on whether it's, there is something lost maybe somewhere in terms of perf or something like that. No, I but, mean, at the end of the day, if you're doing real-time stuff, like the only synchronization primitive that you ever have is still atomic, right? So yeah. Don't yeah. anything else. So, at the end of the day, it has to boil down to like an atomic pointer swap somewhere, yeah. which if you have like a whole structure built like around this, it's relatively mm. easy to implement it that way. And like Juanpe has like libraries which implement this. If you're doing this like event-based stuff, I think it's going to get more tricky. So I'm really like, I would like maybe not now, but I'm curious to like see how you actually solve this. And okay, well, let's talk about it in the day. <laughs> let's talk about this another time, but yeah. Great. Um, so we have a, fav a, a question from uh, Fabian Rangiles. Why is C plus plus twenties flag wait problematic? It's only called in lock, which is only used on the GUI thread, right? But it's the same thing as with the try lock. Like yes, but uh, you have the notify, and the notify is going to do the same thing as the unlock, which is potentially waking up another thread. Okay. Uh, maybe, we have... that, maybe, maybe I got a, the question wrong also. I'm not sure if I... Mm. Uh, we have... If if the question's wrong, Fabian, feel free to uh, clarify. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll come back to it. Uh, so we have a question from Archie. I'm not sure if I understand this, but maybe you do. Are things any better when developing audio applications on hard real-time systems? And if yes, why aren't we getting more hard hard real-time support from desktop OS vendors. Right. So I have to admit that I have exactly zero experience with hard real-time systems. You know, there's obviously stuff like like the Bella and like other like things like that, right? That's probably what you're, what you're talking about. Mm. I have never developed any code for these systems. I just don't really have any experience with them. Uh, so I can't really comment on that. I would be curious to hear from an expert. With regards to desktop um, platforms though, how would you like the problem is that um so so the problem if you do um like on development for audio software on desktop and mobile we, we're doing this like impossible thing where we are uh, developing real-time software on a non-real-time kernel right that's like the fundamental contradiction like none of what we're doing is actually even supposed to work really um and the problem is that yes it's a non-real-time kernel because it's the linux kernel it's the windows kernel it's the it's the mac kernel and, and they're not gonna rewrite their whole operating systems kernel for audio people. So I just don't, like this is just such a fundamental part of how you, you know, architecture the, the kernel of an operating system. I don't think that, well, okay. Well, again, I'm not a kernel expert. So I think Linux and maybe someone like Fabian can comment on this better. Maybe I think Linux has some facilities around like saying, okay, this thread is a real time thread, like really. And then the operating system is gonna do its best to like make sure that this thread is not interrupted. And I think maybe there's even some guarantees around that on Linux. I think this is what Fabian told me last time we talked about this. Um, on Mac and Windows, it's just kind of a black box. So unless they say this and this is real time safe, it's just not. And like, they're not going to rewrite their kernel to like do that. So yeah, I don't know. I probably haven't answered the question, but basically desktop isn't really made for this. Right, so we're doing this weird thing that we're not supposed to do on desktop platforms anyway. So, 
yeah, I think, yeah, I, I don't think there's a satisfactory solution. We need to like keep doing stuff like this to kind of stay afloat, you know? I, I really don't have a better answer right now. Maybe someone else has. Okay. So a uh, question from Will William Light. For the yield test, did you tune the thread priorities uh, such as Sketch FIFO on Linux? No, I did not. Um, this is um, something that I would have to do in like a more detailed benchmark, which I didn't have time to do. But um, I guess in the case where it was just a benchmark where it was just spinning and doing nothing else, it wouldn't make any difference. I think on the, on the high load case, um, I think it would make a difference, but then the high load case, I tested with like a door and a plugin where the, the thread that you get is like at the mercy of, you know, something like juice or like, I guess you could set it up in that way that you could test it, but it's not trivial and I haven't done that particular test yet. So unfortunately, I don't know. Okay. And Fabian says, uh, I'm wondering if there's a way to improve this by collecting heuristics from when the audio thread is running slash sleeping which would be super regular, then the spin lock could predict when the audio thread is asleep and hence is not contending the lock. The UI thread could then sleep until the lock is expected to be free. That's a really interesting suggestion. I didn't think about that. That's super clever. Thank you, Fabian. So I was thinking about just saying, okay, if you get the prepare to play callback, we know what the, the frequency of one callback is. We can use that. But now you're saying we could actually we actually know how much load we have. Like we know how long, not not how long is between one callback and the next, but how long one callback takes. So that's actually a much more useful number um, to tune this. So yeah, that's a great idea. Um, that would be yeah, that would be good. Yeah. Um, what, 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 one question about that though. I mean, it's so important on the comments. Is that going to be regular, especially if you're like. Um, not necessarily in real time, but rendering offline. Yeah. And, you know, because I, I know in some cases the block change, block sizes change, but does prepare to play, does it look at each individual block or does it like just kind of like at the beginning of like. Yeah. So prepare to play gives you the sample rate and buffer size. So you can work out from there how much time is between a callback, assuming that you're doing real time. If you're doing offline rendering, then that's completely wrong, as you say, and, and something completely different is going on. So you would have to account for that case. But then in that case, you don't really care about the GUI and these locks, and it's really not such a problem anyway, I think. Yeah. So you just need to kind of like special case that somehow. And maybe that's just, you know, actually now I think with your comment and Fabian's comment, like using the prepare to play to tune this is probably just not a good idea. What you should do instead is what Fabian said is try to figure out how long one callback takes to complete and use that. That's that's a much better idea, I think. Mm. Okay, we got a question from <clears throat> J.R. Kirby. Uh, would immutable data structures be a different way of saying the tech the same technique as double buffering from computer graphics? Mm. So well they're related, I guess. Um, so it's similar, except that in double buffering, you go back and forth between two copies, basically. Mm -hmm. Whereas with uh, immutable data structures, whenever you have any change, you just peel off a completely new copy every time. Um, but I guess some of the kind of under the hood stuff would probably be similar. In a way, you do like a pointer swap to actually publish the new version of the data structure, that would be probably similar. So there's similarities between them. Okay, great. Looks like we're all good on the questions. So uh, this is a good time for us to wrap up.